Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in your side of the world. Um, thank you so much for being here with myself and beautiful Priscilla Louise, um, who is also an amazing facilitator and channel. Um, you can find her at priscillalouise.com. Can you spell um, your name for us so that we can know where to find you? Yeah, sure. Okay, it's C H R Y S I double L A L E W I E S dot com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been with me for a long time with these facilitations. <laughs> Thank I you. know. I love doing them. <laughs> <laughs> So we're having some freezing of the screen both on her side and mine today. So with that being stated, um, what we want to know is just to kind of get a little vote from the 50 or so of you who are here. Do you want a trance channeling today or do you want clear conduit? It is completely up to you. I'm just going to throw it out there because I'm fine either way. So if you put that in the chat now, just say clear or chance. We have two for clear. One for chance, three more clear. Three, three, four, five, six. Two for, three, two for chance. Three for chance. Much more for clear. Oh, Johannes doesn't mind either way. Four, five for chance. Six for chance. What do I prefer? Um, I don't have preference in these kind of things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're getting like an even split now. Now more people are saying trance. <laughs> yeah. Either. Well, if you do decide trance, then the screen is fine now. You haven't been freezing again, so. It looks from my end as if you're freezing now, but as long as people can hear us, I guess it doesn't matter if we're freezing. So I guess I'll go into a trance. We can get um, a lot more personality coming through that way. He is um, incredible, has an incredible personality and presence that is um, a little different than dad. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for connecting with me. How can I serve you today? Thank you for being here today. We would like to know if you would like to share with us how your childhood was growing up. Mm. Hmm. From the perspective then, there were times of great confusion. I don't understand at that time, at such a young age, what my parents were doing and I knew that it was important. And I became accustomed to my uncle, Joseph, the younger one of the two that you know, 
being seen more as my mentor. He was my spiritual mentor. He was somewhat like my father and trained as such, although not as extensively. My childhood was full of disciplined studies that initially went in the direction of learning about the body and learning medicine. My uncle was a profound physician and for many years, well into age 19, I believe that I too would become a physician or an alchemist of sorts of the body. While this did not last, my childhood was full of longing for my parents' presence. And until I was spiritually developed, I did not understand my father's choice and perceived it as selfish. I did not understand my mother's choice. And they spent many years of service to me, joining me beyond time in other realms, coming to me in spirit, teaching me various things and bringing me into my development spiritually. And after this occurred, then of course, I understood that I had not been abandoned, that I had not been neglected, that these things did not occur, but this took some time. So I would say that there were many years of my childhood that was lonely and confused. And I was initially a quiet child, rather reclusive, a little bit of a hermit, even well into my adulthood, hermitage was my signature mark. But I can say that upon such further advancement in spiritual studies and meditative disciplines, learning throughout my travels, the way of Hinduism, the way of the sage in alchemy, and the way of the monk from the studies of Gautama Buddha, I began to never feel alone again. And my greatest joy would be traveling um, at times with others, but mostly alone, well to the top of the surrounding mountains in India. And I have traveled by foot to the top of many a mountain and then traveled alone by foot, at least alone in form on hot, humid days by my favorite river, the Ganges. And I enjoyed these travels, minimalizing myself, ridding myself of all attachment, even down to clothes. I had but a loincloth and it mattered not. And these were the simplest, purest, most beautiful days of my existence down by the river, honoring the elementals in the water and the elements within all things. And did you travel a lot as a child and through your adult life? Mm, so not as much as the child, no. Mm, I was deeply embedded in my medicine studies. And as I stated prior, I assumed that I would become a medical help of sorts in society at the time travel extended greatly from around age 20 um, until now you are speaking to my essence at around age 55 in my cognition and of course now I am well traveled So it seems like you had a good life 
I have many good lives. And what was the most important lesson you've learned in this life as Johannes? I had to drop all of my pain, grief, resentment over allegedly feeling abandoned by my parents and to go deep into the arms of my father with profound levels of forgiveness and acceptance. And that was the most difficult. <laughs> and then the second thing, I had to learn to become divinely selfish. I mean, this is striking a chord in some of you, I sense, <laughs> because you have a misperception, a misunderstanding of the word selfish. What I mean is to become so of the self, of the divine, to realize the self so strongly. You are selfish, you are of the self so much that all of your action, all of your accumulated memory, that which you call karma, becomes action of the mind, action of the body, action of the spirit, and you are reaching into the technology of kindness and compassion, extending such ecstatic compassion forth with giving hands, but knowing always that you are of the self. And there comes a time in your awakening, beloveds, wherein you feel such initial love and bliss and ecstasy in this oneness and then also a profound loving grief that accompanies not a confusion but a grieving of your past and of all the ways that such accumulated memory which you have called karma carried through into your now all of these limitations, whether they be in relationship or in means of earning your living, as you call it in these modern times, your connections with others, your connections and attachments to things, if it no longer serves the divine self, then you must be selfish enough to relinquish that. And in your modern era of times, you have called these boundaries. Call it what you will, become divinely selfish. You have perceived, even though this goes in stages, this embarking upon enlightenment, you have perceived that you will release everything and then have nothing and no one, and you have misperceived. It is not true. You must understand that the evolution of self, the grand realization of all that is true, once you feel it and you know it and you know its truth, nothing can compare. And you will want to give up anything and everything that no longer serves the self, relationships, substances, forms of all varieties will no longer fit if it is not within the divine self's true nature. But you perceive that you will do this and then from this foundation of burning of the old that you will then be floating upon no foundation. And this is not true. You will not be alone. You are reconstructing and you must burn the old foundation to make room for a new foundation that you have yet to understand in friends and family and connection, education, titles and roles of all jobs of varieties, if you will. It will all shift. Be prepared for that and be prepared that 
you could commonly grieve based upon your misperception, this shift. And you could misperceive that you will be alone. And please know that you will not. It is simply a rebirth. Seeing that you're bringing in rebirth, how would you describe the Christ consciousness that we are experiencing today? You have no human word for its beauty. It is so illuminated. The brightness of the sun without the glare of the ego, the warmth of the fresh spring air without the noise of your society. Do you dare to imagine and you ask in your intentions for this to be shown to you in such divine clarity? And if you do not dare, then I shall dare you. It is freedom. It tastes beautiful. Thank you. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about the struggles with abandonment that you've gone through in your life? It took quite a few moments of time to correct the misperception that my mother had abandoned me. And I could imagine the pain, the suffering that she experienced in order to make the ultimate decision to leave me with my uncle, knowing that she would return in the appropriate timing for my awakening and for my development. And I was a sage in her time, but it did not come easily and the abandonment, as you call it, is the crown jewel of my contracts. The crown jewel that provided accessibility to forgiveness and acceptance. For I was not abandoned. And I was tutored, preened for enlightenment by both Miriam, my mother, by Mariana, my grandmother, and of course, by Yeshua ben Joseph, my father. In most moments, in spirit, they would come to me while my body slept and teach me all of the teachings of the Essenes and the teachings in India. But they made the ultimate sacrifice and they suffered greatly in their decision to leave me with my uncle Joseph, the younger one. And I forgive them for they know what they do and they know that it was in my best interest to develop appropriately the technology of such forgiveness granted me so much divine bliss to ultimately become of the self in all ways. Of course, I learned later that it was I who made the choice as I had become acclimated to my, fa my father's brother, Uncle Joseph. I had become well acclimated and he could not possibly perceive to give me back to my mother and father when they had sent the message that they were now ready to have me. I was an old boy, a teenager. And of course, I um, chose to hasten to my medical studies at that time. It was not any time that I could perceive to return to my mother and father. Forgiveness isn't easy, but if you do not, 
your misperceptions will become your prisons. Seems to be some feedback. Can you hear that as well? Okay, it's just gone. How many siblings did you have, Johannes? And did they also grow up with your uncle? Six, and no, they did not. Mm. So, my mother, um, Miriam, and my father, Yeshua, um, had many children. Uh, both James and, and Joseph and uh, Josephus and, uh, and there, there were four that traveled with them um, into India and Tibet and uh, eventually into southern France. And there was a time of reunion in between those travels. Um, I have a half-brother, uh, Judas, who, um, when I was 20, between ages 20 and 22, lived in Britain. Um, uh, Joseph, is, uh, he lived in Britain as well along with a sister of mine. So there were three siblings, three total. Um, Judas included my half-brother living in Britain and, and then myself, and then three more that traveled with um, my mother and my father uh, to Tibet. I imagine that my mother perceived that I was too young to make such an arduous journey, um, for I was an infant at the time of her decision. And she made this decision with immense grief. And what age were you? when your father Jeshua went through his final initiation on the cross? I was but a child, around a year, one, one year. And you say that you studied extent extensively within the medical field, but I was wondering, did you study with any masters and if you did, what message is there to be shared? Oh, I have always longed to study with Babaji, as it was apparent. We heard word through my father, both in spirit and through messages sent by many ways, that both he and my mother um, were studying with Master Babaji and some of the other masters in Tibet. Um, Joseph, my uncle Joseph, the younger one, um, was my greatest spiritual mentor. And then at that point, I would say that my father um, was equally a strong mentor. And then many gurus in India, many, many gurus in, in India. Okay, again, just a slight feedback there, just waiting for it to go. That is not electronic, that is within the brick and mortar building of the channel. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next question. Can you give us a instruction or a guideline of how to best raise our vibration to access the flow of abundance for ourselves and all. 
I suggest that you abolish the idea. This suggestion may surprise you, but if you are so centered primarily in the focus of this terminology, abundance, of course you must be well seated in luck. What if your primary focus is not to realize that you are God, but just to observe that God has a long way to get to you? If the focus is on other things, what if there were no focus but love, and then the focus would be to remove all that blocks you from giving and receiving love? What if your focus and your studies would be to simply remove the aspects of you that are, as you call in these times, lower frequency, and that would mean forgiveness, acceptance, allowance, more trust in the multitude of ways that God shows up in the form and outside of form for you, with you, as you, within you, both within and without, as above, as below. What if the focus were removing the toxic fears, the panic, the anger, the shame that surrounds you? These misperceptions block your ability to be divinely selfish, and these misperceptions contain such technologies of fear. Of course, it's, um, you could not focus on the technology of abundance without removing the technologies of ego. Do you understand? Yes, I think it makes sense. In other words, your focus would be in the wrong place. Perhaps let's perceive that if you were given and you created all of the abundance that you could possibly want and however you wish for it to show up in your life, then to what point would it be that you are living? If you have all that you want now, what then? Then it's finished. You see, the contract's finished then. Um, the means of mastery involve removing blocks to love. Do that, and then you will not be operating in the false technology of shame and fear and such misperceptions and distractions from God. For God is so apparent and so accessible without these blocks. You see? Yeah, I see. It's as if you are saying, live with the abundance that you have now fully and enjoy the experience. You hold form, you have food, you have a roof over your heads, you could focus on the beautiful technology within this form, within these brains and minds, um, for it is an eloquent technology and you are walking around without a manual to it. The manual was given to me by my Hindu teachers, my Buddhist teachers, the Tibetan monks, the studies that were passed down from my mother and father of the Essenes. And you have all of these manuals, but you do not follow them to honor the technology of breath, of clearing the mind, of not letting the ego have control, not letting fear override God's eloquent, sophisticated system that has been created 
true form in you. You see? And what is the overall message of guidance for the collective at this moment? Stop asking for things so specifically that you limit God's way of showing up in you, as you, through you, for you. For if you come to God and you're saying in your prayers and your meditations and your studies, you are saying, um, I want this, I want that, this relationship, this job, this abundance, this reward. That could be trouble. How are you limiting God? By asking for what you believe is abundance. Open up. Let God just show itself in you, to you, as you, for you. and be observant, be conscious in your choices. You are so often worried, humanity, about karmic influence. Karma is memory that you accumulate in these times. And all of the greatest masters in India and Tibet have taught me that karma is simply memory in action. Action from the mind, action from the body, action from the spirit and emotions. So are you going to access it from the body in ways where the ego mind takes over or the higher mind is in the driver's seat for the body's actions and choices? Is the foundation of that spiritual discernment so that the mind can birth proper karmic choices in physical action. Be conscious of how you are acting about karma. Karma is not a punishment. Karma did not follow you through from another time to punish you or to reward you. It is simply accumulated memory in action. And when you become conscious of this, well, then you are a karma yogi. Then you are in the driver's seat for conscious choices in your life. And then all abundance will be there and be realized. To move into higher consciousness, Johannes, were you taught the ways of astral projecting, remote viewing, using your senses to be able to connect mind to mind? Of course, at a point in time when I was ready for it, but I was a stubborn student of God, probably the most difficult student my father ever had because I was full of resentment and angst and not forgiving my parents and feeling the sting of the misperception of betrayal continually. And at some point when I released it, I began to trust and forgiveness begot trust and trust begot acceptance and acceptance, acceptance begot allowance and allowance provided the accessibility to the grace that is. And then my greatest joy was not astral. It was not in these realms. It was much like in my life as St. Francis of Assisi. My greatest joy was when I released everything that you think fulfills you when I took off the clothes. That is a metaphor and I am being literal. Mm -hmm. And I ran with 
simply a loincloth, naked, through the river. And I let my beard grow. And I cared not about the riches of the world. And I simply served. As God does in form, I served the animals. And I served nature. And all these studies that you believe should come first, that would be the marker of your ascension into what you were deemed to be enlightened, will not be of any great matter when you finally realize who and what you are. You have become greatly attached to something that can be perceived merely as minor rewards on top of the greater, more expansive experience that is available to you and the technology of this body. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. But I am intrigued as well. Were you able to speak to animals? Of course. And they to, to myself. I would like to ask you about Anna, grandmother of Jesus. How was your relationship with her? And is she still alive today? I knew very little of her, and I would see her in spirit as she taught me the ways of the Essenes, and this is how I learned as such, but I did not know her in form, or if I do, I do not recollect. I remember my grandmother, Mariana, quite well. So did you say that you reincarnated as Francis of Assisi? No re. Time is all simultaneous. Can you perceive because that I for a moment? Yes. To drop your perception of linear time of this before that and this after that. I am he now, he is I now. You see? I speak to you in a certain essence, a 55 year old man, speaking of times, but in essence and truth, I am all of these beings at all ages. And you can speak to my essence and my experience of that. And then what? You see, time is not of any utmost significance. And tell us about your family life. Did you have a family of your own? Oh, yes, I had two wives, Ruth and Salome. And it was custom arranged marriage at, at the time that we would bear children of a royal lineage, as my father and mother and grandmother were perceived to be of a Christ's royal lineage. And were you able to teach your children the abilities that you obtained through life? They did not require such tutelage. It does seem like my question pane has frozen. So may I ask all those that are watching if you could ask your questions in the chat box. 
and it seems like there is sound breaking up. So if we could just take a moment and ask everyone if they can still hear us okay. And may I ask the channel if the channel is okay to continue. And it's fine for a brief amount of time. Okay. Seems like everyone almost is fine. So we will continue. And if I may ask if you can put your questions, if you have asked them in the chat section, if you can put them there. So if we are, Johannes, all living simultaneously, are we all gods playing victims through our own creation of the material world? Some of you play victims and prefer it quite well. Some of you play other roles. Um, some of you play savior. Some of you play healer. Some of you play channel. You see where I'm going. Some of you play scientist, doctor, actor. But you're all actors, are you not? It's just hats that you're wearing on top of your heads. It's about the significance of karmic action and what you do when you are not conscious of it. But the moment you become conscious of it, there is a unique bridge between the mind and the body and the soul that is untethered, unbroken. And is it true that we choose our parents when we incarnate here? You choose everything, everything. And I mean every single action, reaction, response. It is all perfect. And you have chosen it. It cannot be otherwise for you are God. And it's time that you accept responsibility that you have chosen it. And if you don't like it, forgive yourself for having chosen it. And forgive others if you continue to project that choice into their awareness. But it begins with you. Always has, always will be. Can you tell us about one herbal medicinal item that has been lost to time, which we could remember now? Mm. My Hindu masters taught me of the medicine of the Nam. N-A-A-M is the most powerful medicine of spirit. But you have remembered quite well all other medicines. It is not a medicine of the body that you need the most. It is the sweetness, the sweet nectar of the numb. This is medicine for your spirit. It's not an herb that you can pick any more off of these lands. This is something that is the sweetest medicine when you surrender to the will of God for you, with you, as you. And if we move into the physical body, what is the main cause of fatigue? Being driven by the ego. It is like running on empty. No energy, no gas in your cars, just running on fumes. For the ego does not exist. The car runs on air, 
course you are exhausted. You are not spiritually fed. Therefore, you are either stubborn or ignorant to food choices. This needs to change dramatically. You wish to consume the sweet medicine of the numb taught through my masters in one hand, and then you consume death in your foods in the other. Do you believe that something cancels out? Hmm? And when we talk about food, would you say the more food we eat, the more energy we take in? Not And then can, okay. Not necessarily. Okay. Yes, it depends upon the food. It is, humanity does not need, I'd say, half of what they consume. <laughs> and what about you and the times that you lived in, what was your food like? Mm. Roots from the earth and berries and seeds, protein, nuts and seeds, flowers for teas and various roots for medicine. <laughs> And there's just some feedback there. There we go. My apologies. Oh. Never, never ever would it suffice to consider the killing of an animal. This is not what my masters taught. Cannot consume death and live. And if you are to consume a product of an animal, it must be with great respect and responsibility. How many people have Jeshua's DNA? It seems we are empowered from his life and the DNA. Mm, in which timeline? This could be infinite. You see the, the, the struggle with this question. Uh, in your timeline, maybe a million, slightly more. And this could change any moment. With the children being born, people exiting, it's, it's, it's a flux. I'm just looking at the questions. In light of explanation on abundance, how do you view the teachings of Abraham Hicks? We shall move further past your question of the involvement of one specific channel and look at the deeper concern which is the more modern view of what abundance is and isn't in your era. In this modern society, there has been massive rampant misperception of abundance and extreme focus and choice. And I'd say that this is faulty these choices to focus so much on abundance. Again, this can only come from lack, this focus in your modern teachings. And it must shift if you would truly understand abundance at all. Thank you very much for that answer. Feedback. Okay. 
Texans with a gun in their ring. How do we survive in this realm if we wish to give ourselves fully to the divine plan? Um, are you a body that must survive? Are you that? Because if you are, then of course death shall suffice in your experiencing. It's not about survival. The concept of survival and that you bring it up in your question um, tells me that you are focused on having to survive death. I believe you mean to ask me how we should thrive. And of course, go with yoga as your foundation. And then it matters not. Everything will fall into place at that point. Johannes, please put your feet on the floor. Jenna needs to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. During your time on this planet in our timeline, did you speak a light language? I did, as well as that of all of the animals that would surround me. With no fear, appreciating the joy, connecting in oneness and love with the plants and the earth and the waters. And I did as such as St. Francis of Assisi. And this is why the animals could understand me and I they. It's because of the purity and the access accessibility of grace in our language together provided for a Christic connection that was ecstatically blissful. A viewer has a question with regards to previous information that's come through. Can Johannes speak on the three days of darkness? Any time it's probable, this month, this quarter, this here, how would life be changed for us after it? Let's start with the concept of time. It is impossible to receive adequate, accurate predictions of something that affects humanity in such a large scale, in such large scale of your consciousness when you are operating in various multidimensional experiences. Therefore, some will perceive it, some will not. Some will perceive it, but it would not affect them and they are simply there to help those who did perceive an experience of such a disaster. But it is also such joy, such rebirth, such opportunity for connection. And while the potential is palpable to the point that many channels can feel it in the roofs of their mouths, they do not fear and neither shall you. It is a grand opportunity to return to simplicity, to return to eating from Mother Earth and drinking from the rivers, building from the materials of your lands for centralized, peaceful government, for diplomacy, for peace between you and animals, for peace between you and other beings, that you do not understand, but you will very soon. And do not worry, just hasten and prepare yourselves in the ways that the Christed ones who have given you information 
And you will feel this in your bosoms if you are speaking through the Christ at once and they have given you information. Listen and prepare. Do not worry about when. For to wait on this brings it closer and matters not when. Perhaps focus on love. Perhaps focus on forgiveness of shame and the avarice running through your governments and collectives. Perhaps forgiving the dream that you are tired and disgusted with when it comes to your daily living. Perhaps making conscious choices about how karma will act through you and perhaps forgiving the times in your past when you have not. Perhaps these would be better directives if you're wishing to alleviate this potential. But again, this potential could be necessary as well. What are you trying to avoid in such a divinely perfect plan? Trust. Focus on the importance of that which is love, is oneness. And then all else falls into place as it should. Prepare the mind, prepare the body, clear the mind. Prepare your homes, clear the mind. Prepare your hearts, clear the mind. Keep clearing the mind. And if rubbish goes back into the mind, clear again and bring divine sound into the mind. For this is the technology that provides the quickest accessibility to the grace that you so desperately wish for. Would you say sound through frequency or sound through mantras and hymns and song? Sound through the repetition of the sacred text that have been provided to you by some of the greatest masters that ever lived in your times and before. And these are not secret you can find them as easily as you can read any sacred text or a master can get them to you if you cannot. There are reasons for the gurus and teachers and masters of this world. Yet you stubborn ones in your modern times are saying, I need not the guru. I need not the teacher. I need not a master for I am God. It is your ego that ignorantly says such. And what was your favorite technique of sound and frequency? Any of the technologies of the ancient Vedas. Any of the breathing that would expand the life force, that which you call Chi. From many masters in Tibet, which taught my father, who then taught me and then combining such technologies as my master Joseph instructed and as Babashi instructed my father who then instructed me. Do you think it's important to awake the Kundalini? I think it's important to understand the Kriyas. The way to combine your breath with the form so that you know that they are not separate, that nothing can be separate. Kriyas keep you alive.
So the following may be a bit of a triggering question. What advice do you have for those who feel that clothes, people, money and of events define who they are? Close your eyes, become focused on your breath. The thought arises, acknowledge by being aware that there is a thought, but it is not you. Sing the divine sounds in your mind or out loud, it matters not. And ask yourself, are you really happy? Are you really joyful? Are you really accessing the deepest levels of happiness that you possibly could? I can assure you that the answer is no. You must begin by being truly honest with yourselves. Thank you. Is the Babaji you speak of the one of Yogananda's lineage? Absolutely. And how does one best call the divine for help when suffering or in need? Observe your definition of suffering. Ask for the medicine of the Naman. Ask to be connected to the truth. Why is your body seeking to get your attention? Why is the suffering there and how is it teaching you? Say you place your hand on the stove and you say, I suffer. Yet with your other hand, you hold it to the stove and then you cry, I suffer, I suffer, this is hot. Lift your hand. You hold yourself to such karma by repeating the same actions the same ways of being selfish, and when I mean selfish in this definition, I mean egoically selfish by being unconscious and unaware of your choices, and then the body dies. This is your body crying out for breath, for exercise, for sunlight, for proper foods and nourishment, and for proper spiritual practice. Give it that. And once you have adequately done this, come back to me and tell me you suffer and tell me honestly if you suffer after you have done diligent commitment in spiritual practice. Are you okay for a few more questions? It might be more respectful for the channel's body at this time to close here. Well, thank you very much for giving your energy through the channel today. Indeed, there are many Christed ones who come through this channel and she greatly enjoys the connection. Okay, so I'll just ask you to step back from the channel and bring the channel back. Oh, 
always feel like I've been asleep for a thousand years when I do something like this. <laughs> oh. Thanks My for question me. box froze. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. It, it's the same as when we bring through Yeshua, we have all of these technological disturbances no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. Um, yes, the but we pulled through, so that's good. Yeah, absolutely. How was the channeling for you? Oh, I don't remember much right now. <laughs> that's good. So I hope that all of you enjoyed the messages, and um, I think I'm going to go take some rest. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you, everyone, for putting your questions down. I really appreciate it. You got me out of a st sticky situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Chrysalis. See you. Bye.